The Decline of Merry England It is the fashion of the modern historian to sneer at the phrase Merry England. It never existed, they say. How could it? Look at this, and that, or over yonder, pointing to some grisly feature, a burning, a disemboweling, or a less dramatic but equally flagrant catastrophe. Come, smell this, they say, shoving a bunch of rank injustices under one's nose, merry England forsooth. And they pass on, whistling, a little flat, a tune by Sullivan or German. If one only had the nerve to pluck these learned iconoclasts by the gown and to say, Quite so, but stay a little, good sir. The facts you have presented to me are tainted. They are impregnated with your own twentieth-century humanitarianism. An Elizabethan did not look at the wheel and the cart, the ambuscaded highway, the stinking kennel with your eye, with the sentimentality for the human body and the human mind which you affect. In two centuries, maybe, you yourself will be no better to the occupier of your place than a gross barbarian, the spawn of the industrial age, with your shattering engines, your blackened cities, your malodorous roadways, your speed and your din, with your grotesque wars, your more grotesque peace, your absurd cylindrical clothing. Trousers, as a luckless poet discovered nineteen centuries ago, are the mark of the barbarian. You may in truth possess what you call the historical eye, the ability to perceive facts, incidents, trends and circumstances, transparent to the eyes of the actor, twined up in them and buffeted to and fro. But can you transport your mind two, three or four centuries, see with that actor's eye or think with his brain? No. Instead your mind flies to the heirs of Sir Edward German, to peasant throne pottery, cottage industries, and a dozen other faint reincarnations of those days. You see the sign board, ye oldie what ye not, and you murmur, forgetting the past, Merry England. Bah! The historian has dismissed Merry England into the dismal limbo where, amid a number of other broken legends, lie Homer at the Isles of the Hesperides. And it behoves us, first of all, to draw it from the darkness and to examine the poor thing, to see if it does, in fact, deserve the historian's easy condemnation. Its condemnation is based on a misapprehension of the meaning of the word merry in this particular conjunction. To the 19th and 20th centuries, it is almost the equivalent of the word happy. It stands side by side with the merry peasant, that ineffable piano exercise, and conjures up a romantic vision of neat herds and shepherdesses dancing on a lawn to the notes of the pipe and tabor. It is a pleasant dream, but not so have countries been merry. The word merry is catalogued in the great Oxford Dictionary under many shades of meaning, but in this particular connotation it is translated as pleasant, delightful, poor thin transformations of a word that stands on its own two legs, and what is worse, truly inept to the examples given. The first is dated 1436 and it is the crown of merry england the second comes from the fairy queen it runs saint george of merry england the sign of victory pleasant delightful are these the qualifications aimed at by spencer when he wrote to that warrior sentiment surely not the word here represents a state or condition the exact meaning of which cannot be enclosed in a single word if an equivalent must be found Perhaps high-hearted might do. In the Old Testament, some such state is often clearly indicated. Joseph drinks and is merry with his brethren. The Philistines are merry in their cups when they send for blind Samson. A merry heart, says Solomon, doeth good like a medicine. If Spencer's phrase is considered in relation to the time when it was written, it cannot but have some such meaning. Spencer brought it to London in the year 1589, and it is here, or hereabouts, that England might truly be epitomised as merry. Consider England at this time. For a century now, she had had a strong dynasty on the throne, a dynasty which, whatever the public and private morals of its representatives, possessed a most unroyal faculty for ruling. The great barons had been brought to heel. The Act in Restraint of Appeals, 1533, 
had freed England from interference from beyond its borders. The monasteries had been dispossessed. The country, after centuries of internecine and foreign warfare, had been welded into a whole. Twenty years earlier the relics of a bygone age had attempted a revival. The rebellion of the Northern Earls had been blown out like an anachronistic rush dip, and its leader, the Duke of Norfolk, had paid with his head for his ill-timed experiment. The last hundred years, too, had seen the face of the world changed. The discovery of America and its potentialities had reorientated Europe, its politics and its economics. What had before been a semi-barbarous island insecurely hung on the edge of the map had, by the enterprise of seamen adventurers, been transported to its centre. The new world lay open for England's taking, its fruits, its minerals, its wealth. Only to the south, Spain, a country old in experience, backed by the Holy Roman Empire and the Papacy, and thrust nearer than its slender rival towards the southern gold-bearing regions, stood in England's path. But the year in which Spencer brought his three cantos to London was the year that succeeded the first coming to terms with the southern enemy. The great armada had been shattered, its ships harried and sunk, its crews and men-at-arms cast drowned up and down the island coasts. At last England had some inkling of her strength, the power drawn from a well-knit body and young muscle. A new Atalanta, she had become conscious of her ability to outrun this powerful but ageing veteran. This consciousness, this pride of strength, was what made England merry. Not merry in the sense of pleasant, but a fierce joy, a merriness as of Samson when he bore away the gates from Gaza. Despite all his jeremiads and invectives against the Englishmen of his day, the good canon of Windsor, William Harrison, abounds in this merriment. In his description of England, published a year before the Armada sailed, there swells up again and again the ground base of a happy pride, almost a vaunting of this cockerel country. The English, remarked a Venetian ambassador in the 15th century, are great lovers of themselves and of everything belonging to them. They think there are no other men like themselves, and no other world but England. And whensoever they see a handsome foreigner, they say that he looks like an Englishman and that it is a great pity that he should not be an Englishman. Vastly proud, almost sure of itself, and troubled seriously as yet by Calvinist mystics, with the ripples of Renaissance culture just bearing its treasures to these shores, secure in its monarch, secure in its strength, what else could England be but merry? This is the state, this the condition, which brought the phrase to Spencer's pen. Then our age was in its prime, a very merry, dancing, drinking, laughing, quaffing, and unthinking time.